to do that. Okay. All right. Okay, we'll pause for a second and I'll just say hello. Hi, Angeline. Thank you so much for being here with me on The 6%. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you today because I think I'm going to learn so much talking to you. I am basically completely uninformed about your field, but I do know that it is very male dominated. There are very few women that work as, you know, for, for kind of more of a generic term as mechanics. There's so much more nuance to that and you're going to tell us about it, mm -hmm. but you know, there just aren't a lot of women in this field. And I'm, I'm pretty sure there are some women out there who are curious and want to get into the field and just kind of don't know where to start or they're intimidated. So I thank you for being on because I think it's going to help a lot of women. Oh, I'm really excited. There's definitely a lot of women who either don't know how to get started or are struggling to continue their career. So hopefully this will help them out. Absolutely. So tell me about what your childhood was like and, and did you know any mechanics? Did, how did you get introduced to this and how did you get interested? So I didn't grow up with any mechanics. Uh, no one in my family uh, I didn't really even learn that I wanted to do this until I was about 17. I was a 16 or 17. I was a junior in high school and I went to a drifting event in Vegas with my friends and I just couldn't get enough of it. I was up against the fence. I wanted to know everything about every one of those vehicles that day, which is kind of impossible. Um, so tell me what, tell me what drifting is. I think I kind of have an idea, but I'm sure there are a lot of listeners who may not kind of hard to explain it's um <laughs> it's kind of an automotive sport where yeah that's really hard to explain um yeah i'm sorry i really don't know how to explain it very well i guess you kind of just it's on a track and they have multiple cars sometimes it's time trials sometimes they're going up against each other and mm -hmm. they're basically losing control of their vehicle while staying in control so the back end will slide out from underneath them and so it's just tire squealing loud noises engines roaring that kind of stuff i could see how you would be like wow <laughs> <laughs> there was actually one other experience i had as a much younger like five or six years old that i didn't even think about until my adult life um my parents used to own a restaurant and we sponsored a car that would do nothing professional, but just races out at the racetrack down there, the um, Las Vegas Motor Speedway. And we got out of the car. You could hear everything in the parking lot. And I freaked out. I was crying. My parents had to drag me inside. Oh no! <laughs> I was so scared because it was just loud noises. And they said within yeah. the first, like after the first couple laps, the security guard was pulling me off the fence to bring me back to my parents because I just wanted to be on the track with, it. I just That's wanted to be awesome. as close as I could. So That's I should have really known cool. earlier that that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> and so who were your influences growing up? Um, I didn't really have any for the most part um, towards automotive mm -hmm. until high school when I started to get into it. And then I had uh, my high school shop teacher, actually, who was the first person that was supportive. Um, he really pushed me. And then we had a hot rod club that we would work with. And one of the main leaders of the group, he was also really encouraging and he would give me jobs and it didn't matter that I was a girl. He'd, Hey, do this. And then I would just do it. Whereas mm -hmm. a lot of times they didn't want to trust me with that stuff. Just I'm not sure. They just didn't know what I could do. And if I was even serious about it. So those were probably my two biggest influences right off, like right away. Now, I'm sure you, just like I have, when people go, hey, what are you going to, what kind of a career are you going to go into? Like when I, when I was in medicine and I said, well, I'm, I'm going to go into orthopedic surgery, you know, you get people who go, hmm, yeah, that's not really a field for women. That's not a good field for women, or there aren't a lot of women who do that. And, and like even more mean things that are said. So <laughs> what did people say to you when you said, I'm, I'm going into mechanics? No. <laughs> no, it was probably the biggest response. Um, for the first people I told that I really wanted to do it was my parents. And mm -hmm. I remember the conversation perfectly. I said, I think I want to go to school for this. I really think that I want to turn this into a career. And my dad said, no, this is a hobby. This is not a career. You're not doing it. Oh, um, wow. They're much more supportive now. That, that 
that not supporting didn't last very long as soon as they kind of saw how happy it made me. Um, yeah. But yeah, I definitely get a lot. Even today, people, I tell them what I do and they're like, oh no, I would never guess that. There's no way. So right. it's, <laughs> it, it was very discouraging. I think part of, you know, it's, it, it, it's interesting. And I wanted to, to talk a little bit about kind of bias and even the unconscious or inherent bias that just exists in our society. And, and even us as women are victim to it, right? Because you'll see somebody mm-hmm. and you're like, huh, that person doesn't look like an X, Y, or Z, even though I myself am in one of those male dominated fields. It's like, I, I would succumb to that too. And I think that it, it seems like it's a really big task to make that kind of a cultural shift where people stop to think that this is what a mechanic looks like and this is what an orthopedic surgeon looks like. And so you must have encountered that as well. Oh, constantly. Even now, um, I recently was working in the field and I showed up to a customer's house to work on their generator. And first thing out of the guy's mouth is, oh, I was waiting for a man. <laughs> well, this is what you're getting, sir. Sorry. Right. Right. And I think that, you know, many, many times they'll make a comment like that and they're just speaking out loud. And I would hope that oftentimes they go, huh, well, you're a woman. Okay. Well, do the job. But then there's, I'm sure there are times when people are like, mm, yeah, no, I can't have a woman doing this. Have you had that experience? Oh, man. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> When I first started at this branch that I'm at now, I had um, many times I would talk to the customers because I'm the only person that's in the shop that does my specific job. And so supervisors and other technicians are not super familiar with it. So there's a lot of times where I would actually have to face the customer, which technicians usually don't do. Mm -hmm. And I would have to explain to a customer, this is what's going on. This is how I found it. And I would explain it multiple times. And no, that's not it. There's no way. I'm a mechanic. I did this for years. I'm a mechanical engineer, all kinds of stuff. And then yeah. as soon as my, my boss, who's never been a mechanic, who's never had any technical abilities, comes in and he tells them the exact same thing. And all of a sudden, they're like, that makes sense. Yeah. So it's, that's, that's hard. That's hard. And that's frustrating. And that you still deal with that on a day-to-day basis, right? Oh, yeah. Constantly. Yeah. It's, it's more common that customers won't listen to what I tell them. They don't want to hear what I have to say. Um, but there are, <laughs> there are still customers that are supportive. How do you handle that? And how do you manage that both externally and internally? Externally, I just got to keep smiling. And if they don't want to listen to me, they'll listen to someone. And internally, I know what I can do. I'm very confident in my skills. And if they want it repaired by the best, they're going to bring it to me and I'm going to fix it. And Mm -hmm. simple as that, if you don't want it done by me, that's fine. But I can promise better quality work and I'm going to be confident in my skills and I'll be able to put something out that I'm proud of and that the customer will also accept. They'll be proud of it too. How do you not get angry and how do you not let that overtake you and take away the joy of what you do at work? I I do get angry. Uh, One benefit of working on machines and not working on people, um, I can definitely express that anger. Uh, There's a a lot of tool throwing, a lot of inappropriate (laughs) words, conversations in my head, things I would love to say that I can't. Uh, It's right. And and then the people in my life, usually I come home and if I've had a bad day, they get to hear about it and hear the kind of stuff that people say. And it's just, I kind of have to find outlets for that anger. But if you're passionate about something, it doesn't matter what else is around it or the struggles because it's what you love. I mean, regardless of how other people around me treat me and how they respond, I'm still doing what I love every single day. And I think with the things that you do, you've mentioned that you've, you've done uh, public speaking, you've done some mentoring and also just even being on a podcast and talking about your work. I think that's, that's one way to share with people what actually happens to women in your field and maybe one way to start creating, start creating change there. Um, tell me a little bit. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit. Oh, my gosh. That was an unintentional pun. <laughs> so let's shift <laughs> gears. And um, let's talk a little bit about, you'll have to give me like the second graders version of 
of mm -hmm. what it is you do, the kind of schooling that's required, the different certifications and different levels of mechanic. Um, give me an overview of that because this is this is the fun part where I get to learn <laughs> a lot. So there's a lot of different stuff in my field, but specifically for what I do, um, usually people go to a two-year trade school. Sometimes they can go to a community college or universities, they'll have it and you can get them. My specific degree is in occupational studies, not specifically automotive. Mm -hmm. um, but I came out of that school with certifications on Cummins engines and also Ford. Um, I got, I did the Ford FACT program, which was all their certifications to be able to come out and work on everything that's warrantable, which is when the company is still covering cost of any damages based on their, like, the machine failure versus user error. Mm -hmm. um, so in automotive, there's other certifications like ASEs, which is um, what most of like mechanics when you go to dealerships or anything will have. Diesel is a little different. I don't have all of that. There are certain certifications I've had for machines I use, like the air conditioning machine that I'll use, and then electrical certifications now that I do power gen, just because I am working with more dangerous electricity that can just, mm -hmm. it, it could knock me out real quick. So tell us what power gen training. is. <laughs> so Sorry. Power, <laughs> power generation, it's generators. Um, so it's using an engine's mechanical energy to transfer that into an electrical energy that is usable. So the ones I work on a lot are in RVs. It's the part where your engine's not running, you're parked, but you have mm -hmm. all the power inside so you can watch TV, you have air conditioning. Um, and then there's also standby units, which is if the power goes out of your house, Mm -hmm. This engine starts up that has this giant alternator on the end and produces power to run your house while the grid is down. Uh, mm -hmm. And then it's also for backup systems, for hospitals, for hotels, any major buildings um, and data centers is really big because data centers cannot go down. So they'll have right. three rounds of backup generators. Like it's, it's crazy how many they have. Right. Um, and you, you think about with the various natural disasters, man-made disasters, whatever that mm -hmm. can happen and our reliance on having an electrical source uh, ranging from industries like the hospital systems, such as, he, as you mentioned, to even just in our own home. And we're so reliant on that. This is like, this is a really crucial piece of equipment. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, so tell me about the different levels of certification. Um, so we have different tech levels. We start out with um, your entry level position where you do the same jobs in each of the tech levels, but you get to, uh, you get promoted by efficiency. So there's hmm. something it's called billable hours. So that's what the customer is actually paying. So when you go and you get a quote at a car dealership and they tell you, okay, this is how much the labor is going to be. That's how many hours we're charging you. And you're judged on efficiency if you can meet those hours or if you go over. Hmm. And so it's kind of a percentage billable versus actual hours. And so okay. as you as you get better, you start to be able to be SRT, which is standard repair times, which is determined by the company. Um, and so that's how you kind of get promoted as well as getting more certifications specifically for certain engines or certain generators. It's all training that's provided by the company as well. Ah, uh, okay. So that's eye opening. So like, for example, but me as just somebody who owns a regular consumer auto, when I take mm -hmm. that into say like my dealership, they may say, okay, it takes four hours to do whatever. And they may charge everybody four hours, but they may have a technician that would take six hours or a technician that might only mm -hmm. take two. Is that what you're yeah. talking about? Absolutely. Um, gotcha. And in okay. the automotive side, they do flat rate which means mm -hmm. that the technician is only getting paid based on the, the hours that are charged to the customer. Um, I'm lucky in the diesel industry, ours, it, heavier equipment, it's kind of, it, it's a little bit different. Ours is all hourly, so I get paid regardless, but I'm still judged on how quickly I can get it done. Gotcha. So was there ever a time when you 
were passed over for some kind of advancement or promotion or some opportunity. And you mentioned your experiences sometimes with customers and uh, being mm -hmm. a woman, but what about from a more career level? Was there a time where you feel like you didn't get an opportunity just purely on the basis for being a woman? Absolutely. Um, and this was before the company I'm at now. Uh, when I was still in school, I had applied for a loop tech position with uh, an automotive company. This is before I switched to diesel. Mm -hmm. And everything in the interview went great. My scores, all my, my attendance record, everything school-wise and on paper, I, I should have gotten the job. But one of the questions they asked me was, how do you think you'll be able to handle what the guys say? And I told them I, I, would, I would stand up for myself. I would correct the behavior. And if it got something where it was just pure harassment, then I would take it over to management and HR and I would bring those concerns up. And I didn't get the job. Um, they were worried wow. that the, <clears throat> the other techs who had more experience, um, that they would say things because they didn't want girls there. They didn't want a female in the shop. Um, they'd have to change their behavior, which they didn't want to do. Uh, so he was afraid that I would complain and then they'd have to get rid of them. So this lube tech who is doing oil changes and not really bringing in much money for the company would now mm -hmm. cost them higher employees who have been there for years. And so it wow. was from a business perspective, I understand, but that's, that's not appropriate. That's not an appropriate question, I think, to even ask in an interview. Oh, it's so totally illegal. <laughs> yeah. So Yeah, was, totally. Yeah. Of course, I was 19 at the time, so I didn't know how to address that or what to bring it up. I just, I didn't get the job. So I looked for another one and I actually got another job um, mm -hmm. with a, another company. It wasn't a dealership, but they worked on a specific brand. And when I first started, the higher up mechanic, the highest level. He was extremely helpful. He taught me, he shared tools wow. because tools are expensive and I was in school and broke. I didn't have any. He shared everything. Well, he got let go and the guy beneath him. So it was just me and this other guy working in the shop. Mm -hmm. And I went from just doing oil changes and alignments and brakes to now I'm troubleshooting these vehicles that I've never even worked on. And he didn't want me there. He didn't help me. Wow. He didn't share his tools. And I ended up losing that job. My goodness. You know, it's, it, it's, there's so much about that story that, that we could talk about. You know, I think that when you have the mentors and when you have those people who are like your cheerleaders and want to prop you up, it's so, it's so amazing and it's so important to have. And, and those those people can be male or female. And a lot of times when you're in a male dominated field, they, they just end up being male because there aren't any women to help mm -hmm. do that. And so it kind of speaks to the whole he for she movement and how important that is. And, and, you know, I think a lot about how, uh, you know, that's important because like, you know, you get a lot of times you end up in kind of this boys club environment. And like for us, there's the, there's the women's locker room, there's the male locker room, men's locker room. And, you know, you kind of have to have advocates and allies in both locker rooms. You know, because if there is somebody in that other locker room that's going to be talking smack or saying something inappropriate, there has to be somebody there who's going to be like, look, this isn't tolerated here. This is not our culture here. And mm -hmm. so that's, it's unfortunate that, you know, after your, your ally left, that you were stuck with this guy who clearly wasn't secure enough to prop up a young up and coming mechanic, right? Yeah. And so like, you know, when, when life or circumstance has knocked you down, how do you get back up? What, what makes you keep going? Passion. Nothing, there's nothing that will stop me from doing this. I, I know there's something inside of me that as soon as I started to do it, I realized this, it, it's almost like what I was meant to do from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Like this was decided before I even knew about it. So that, um, anything worth doing is going to be worth the risk. It's going to be worth all the struggles and it kind of makes it more rewarding. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know for a fact that I've earned exactly where I'm at and I've earned all my accomplishments. And I don't know if everyone can say that for their careers. A lot of times you just, you can get into them and you can work, but it's, there's not a lot of adversity. Whereas something like this, it's just, that's all it is. And so yeah. it, I, I feel a bigger sense of accomplishment. And every time I win, every time, not, 
not put them down, but every time I can outdo one of my male counterparts, it, it's just even more rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's kind of like your, your personal barometer for kind of how you've achieved the next goal and how you keep pushing mm -hmm. yourself. Right. So yes. has there ever been a time where, you know, I think that it, you come across as just being very internally driven. You kind of keep your eye on the prize, but have you had times where doubts creeped in and you go, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Oh no, I've made a big mistake. And, and who am I to be doing X, Y, and Z? Has that ever happened to you? Oh yeah. Um, school was a big one. Uh, being the only girl in all my classes, that was really hard. There was a lot of harassment that mm -hmm. it almost made me want to quit, but it wasn't what I wanted to do that was in the way. It was the people. Um, and I actually did have a branch that I had worked at where I love what I did, but I was miserable. I hated going to work. I, it, it almost didn't make it worth it. And I tried to change the culture and I couldn't. And so I relocated and I'm happier than ever where I'm at now. I'm supported and it, it's nice because I know that they can still hear my name. They, I know they see it. And yeah. so that's, that's kind of nice to know that, it's Hey guys, <laughs> you didn't, you didn't think I could do it, but all I needed right. was just, I needed my fellow technicians out of my way so I could accomplish what I needed to. Yeah. And unfortunate that I had to leave where I was at, which was my home, but mm -hmm. it was worth it in the end. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a little bit of payback having your name out there and be like, see what I can do and mm -hmm. kind of your loss, right? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Totally. So um, you, we talked a little bit earlier about how you have mentored and, and you've spoken. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do in those arenas? Yeah, so I've had a couple of different things I've done. In high school, I gave a speech about being a female and this was at a uh, convention for aftermarket auto parts. Um, and that was just kind of helping educate the people who were in that field, like, hey, this is what girls who are coming in. These are our struggles. This is what's standing in our way because companies now have so many initiatives to hire females mm -hmm. and they don't understand why they can't, why there isn't any interest in this field. And so a lot of the talks I've done have been about that. Um, and then one of the speeches I actually gave at my current position was a Women's Day speech. We did International Women's Day and we were gonna do it just with the women in the shop, like all the supervisors and stuff like that. And we kind of realized that takes away the whole point of equality. Why would I only have the women come in? So we offered it mm -hmm. for the entire branch, anyone who wanted to. And one of the managers took it upon himself to tell everyone they had to be in there. Um, and that was actually really difficult because I had to be able to get their attention and still use it as an educational moment without coming off like I was complaining about stuff because right. these mechanics, they're so not sensitive, but kind of to women's issues. Like they don't want to mm -hmm. hear about it. So mm -hmm. I ended up doing an entire speech on female inventors, things that they use daily, things that have pushed the automotive field forward and how they were women, how women did it and how there's a lot of inventions that women can even take credit for because they weren't allowed to have patents because they had to have their husbands or their fathers sign for it. Yeah, And it, it's just that, that stuff is wild to be how the wives of some of these big companies have actually made products for these companies that the husband gets all the credit for. So I've been able to kind of show them that without getting on a soapbox and complaining right. about how hard it is. So right. that's kind of cool. I've been able to navigate ways to do it. Um, and for the most part, everyone was very supportive except one, one person who walked out. Before the before it even started, he walked out. <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't ready. <laughs> oh, he hadn't oh reached gosh. that level of enlightenment yet. <laughs> no, he he's definitely he was my biggest obstacle at this location. Yeah, yeah. So if you had one piece of advice for a woman who wanted to get into your field, what would that be? Don't give up. Uh, it's worth it if you can just keep going. Um, it, it, a lot of women might not agree with this, but in a way you can't, you can't be sensitive. You can't take it personal. And especially with automotive, it is locker room talk all day long, mm -hmm. every day. And you can't change it. You can't change people. You can draw a line and you can try to educate them. But for the most part, just it's worth it. You just keep going and 
keep your head down and just do your work. Let your work speak for itself rather than trying to change everything all at once because it's, yeah. it's going to take years. You got to yeah. earn that respect before you can make those changes. That's, I think that's really, really good advice. I think, I think your workplace sounds sometimes a little bit like my workplace because the OR can be like that. <laughs> <times>. <laughs> so um, if our listeners want to find you online and, and just kind of keep up with what you're doing, where can they do that? Uh, the best place would be on Instagram. My, uh, my name is Angie.Savage. Um, it's my personal account, but they can always go on there, reach out to me. And I do post a lot about my job and a lot about things I do in the community to reach out to women as well. I'll definitely be following along. Thank you so much for being <laughs> on with me today. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to hear more about the podcast and to actually kind of listen to all the different careers from other women. Thank you. Thanks again. Awesome. Well, that was great. Awesome. Uh, that's going to be, I'm really excited for this episode. That's, I think it's just going to be very eye-opening, you know, and, and in my intro, I was also going to say that when, when I was introduced, introduced to you as a potential guest, you know, was, uh, I was like, oh, you know, because I kind of created a list of different fields of people I wanted mm -hmm. to talk to and, and some of the things that jumped out to me, obviously. And, um, and I was like, oh, I hadn't thought of this, but I, I, it, it occurred to me that it just even in my own personal experience, I was like, I have never even met a female mechanic. I'm like, this is definitely <laughs> a great one for the podcast. I was really, really excited about that. How did, how did you get, you know, and, and, and Mook has like connected me with so many women and he is like, I have so many more to send to you. And I was like, okay, let me try to get everybody in. How, how did mm -hmm. you guys, how are you all connected? Um, we actually had just kind of started talking online, just kind of asking each other, get interested in each other's lives, which was kind of cool. And then just huh. built this relationship where um, he's, he's been very involved and very supportive of what I do. Um, yeah. so I think that's kind of what started it all. Mm -hmm. um, is he, does he function as, is this more of uh, uh, just like a, a, a casual uh, connection or is he actually functioning as like an agent for you? Oh, no, it's just a, just a personal friendship. Oh, cool. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, because I've talked to some other women who um, he is a speaking agent for. And so he sent me a lot of women um, that do a lot of public speaking. And so I'm, I, I am, I'm like, you know a lot of people. <laughs> he is so a very social person, yeah. <laughs> very social. And I mean, that's kind of like how, I don't even remember how I, oh, uh, it was a woman who is a dentist who had reached out to me on Twitter because she had done some event for uh, Snoop's football camp, like his charity mm -hmm. football camp. And um, she said, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. And then, and then she said, oh, you know, this is my speaking agent. You should connect with him because he may have a lot of people that would be interested in doing your podcast. And so that's how I got connected. And now, like, you know, he'd, he'd sent me all these people. So it's great. He's, he's just really building his own little community. It's actually, it's yeah. really cool. It is very cool. Well, <laughs> it was so nice to talk to you. Um, where do you live in Portland? I'm in Milwaukee. Oh, okay. I'm in Northeast. So I'm like in that Grant High School area. Okay. Yeah. So we're really close here. Um, I've talked to, gosh, I've talked to maybe only two other people in Portland. I've talked to folks kind of all over a lot of Midwest and East Coast and even one or two in the UK. Um, but I did talk to a friend who actually two girls who are urologists here and that's super rare too um and they always they have some interesting stories but those were my only other two portland people so i'm excited to talk to another person from here mm -hmm. there's a there's an event actually the oregon trades women's career fair um, oh cool yeah it is uh, there's the first day is for middle school high school girls the second day is open to the public um if oh. you just look up oregon trades women online it'll go to their page usually it's in may but i think they moved it to september but i'll be out there teaching how to work on engines like valve adjustments but it's all women in trade so there's people carpentry there's roofing um more electrical stuff there's PGE is out there. They have people climbing up the poles. I mean, it's, and it's all women and it's really, really cool. So if you ever just want to feel inspired, 
that's a really good place to check out. And you could always meet new people for the podcast as well. That's awesome. Um, I am going to, I'm going to like kind of do a reverse question and answer because I'm going to take part of that. And I, I want to ask the question so we can include that and, and stick that in the podcast as well. And so let's see. So how do I want to, how do I want to ask that? Um, okay. So I'll just say, can you tell me a little bit about how you are out in the community here in your hometown, now hometown of Portland, Oregon, showing young women and girls what you do? And so we'll have that as the, um, well, the connection's being a little funny. We'll all have that as the question. Does that sound okay. good? And then yeah, we'll kind of cut, perfect. we'll kind of cut your answer and kind of shift things around and, and put that in there. Oh, I love that's that. That's perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So have a great day. Enjoy the day. I don't know if it, it looked like it was sunny earlier and now it looks a little bit more gray, but I hope you have a really good rest of your weekend. And um, when that comes along, I will have to come by and just say hi. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's fantastic. It's my favorite event out here. That's awesome. All right. Take care. Have a good one. Thank you. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye.